I don't know if that's a good enough break for you. And I guess stretch your legs, get some coffee. Like, I appreciate how you all being here. Staking it out all the way through. It's a long day. Um, at the same time, I hope you see the benefit of, uh, of having uh, this much wealth, wealth of information kind of condensed into information. Obviously, we will have it available on the website. You can view it on YouTube and Facebook. Um, if you'd like to kind of go over the information again, uh, some of this stuff is hopefully for some of you kind of old hat. Um, but definitely for, um, for me, there has been significant new information, both as I have studied over the last couple of weeks in preparing for this, but also in regard to listening to different people as they have studied. There is too much information out there concerning the Reformation to be absorbed in six lessons, eight lessons, even in a couple of weeks of significant study. So uh, the more that we kind of like uh, uh, take in, uh, the more we can both appreciate the men who stood against a monster. I'm not trying to call the Catholic Church a monster. <laughs> but even in the figurative sense, they were on an island against, against people that would literally kill them. And they did. And they, they, a lot of them were killed for just asking questions, um, even for something that we would consider to be an abomination today as far as even just, hey, I don't want to preach in Latin. Well, then you're dead. That's, that's just it's 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 uh, something that's unimaginable in today's society uh, was happening to them. Um, I do want to tell you why I'm not a reformer, though. I'm not a reformer because I don't, I don't want to go back to the Catholic Church. I'm not a Protestant because I'm not protesting anything. Now, we understand that both of those ideas, Protestant and Reformation, um, or were against the the only thing that was available at the time. At the same time, we don't need to go back. We don't need to try to to re uh, to join them. If anything, our call should for them to be join us and understanding the truth. Uh, we were talking about Lyle Murphy earlier and dealing with it as a, a missionary to the Catholics. It's it's a difficult scenario. Because they, they'd hold to different sources of authority. It's not just how to interpret that authority. They hold to different sources of authority. When you have that, you, you're, you're talking in circles at that point. I know Stephen Zane and I have several different instances. It's difficult with our Catholic friends. Um, we can wish them um, well. We, we cannot wish them success. It's unfortunate for that. We pray that they, they do come and see the light. Um, but I don't consider myself a reformer or a Protestant. I consider myself to be a Bible believer, a Christian who believes in Jesus Christ. And so um, I just want to make that distinction for myself, not for anyone else, just for myself. With that, let's go and open in prayer, and we'll go ahead and jump into our study on sola gratia. God in heaven, you are supreme. You are the authority. You have given us all things. You've given us life and breath. You created us, and we rebelled against you. We have no right to claim anything, and there's nothing on this earth, there's nothing in our ability, there's nothing in our mind or our imagination that we can ever do to make up for our rebellion. You did it for us, and you did it by your grace. As we go learn today, help us to appreciate who you are more, to understand grace all the better, and to understand exactly what the battle has been over the centuries, and as we continue the fight in this day and age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so quickly we're going to go through a couple ideas here, try to stretch our muscles out, uh, some information you've heard, some information you will not have heard. If it's something I know that we've heard already, I'll try to skip it. If not, uh, well, repetition is the best teacher. So as we have seen so far in the lessons previous, there was an a Reformation in the 1500s. The anniversary of the Reformation, anyone know? October 31st, 1517, it's the, it's the anniversary of when Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the wall, to which that was not the beginning, as we have seen. And it really didn't, it was kind of like it was some questions, as Luther put it, um, they, he was just attacking the money. That, that's what made him upset, and that's what kind of st really stirred the pot. 
In this lesson, we'll briefly observe the theology of God in reference to grace. Uh, so that we see the theology uh, to, uh, to grace from around 100 AD to 1500 AD. We'll see how the reformers and the sine qua non, the literal grammatical historical interpretation of method of scripture, um, and how they understood grace appropriately based upon their reading. And finally, we will promote a true understanding of grace by applying the method, the literal or normative grammatical historical um, method of reading scripture appropriately and consistently. So first of all, let's go through some people. Ignatius said about grace, therefore, let us not be ungrateful for his grace. For if he were, un uh, were to reward us according to our works, we'd cease to be. Uh, about 100 AD, very, very soon after. Now, I'll give you a word about the church fathers. They're not authoritative. I'm not trying to say, here's what they said so we can hinge upon them. No, not necessarily. What we can understand is that they, they did have an understanding in certain aspects. And we also are going to observe how quickly it goes, it goes awry. Irenaeus in 180, Christ redeemed us righteously from our rebellion by his own blood. But as regards to those who have been redeemed by, he does this by his grace. For we have given nothing to his, to, to his previously, nor does he desire anything from us as if he stood to need of it. That's a, that's a, I mean, it's lengthy that, you know, they can tell that's old language, but very, very informative as far as our understanding of he, he got it. You don't need to repay God. It's nice to do so. It's nice to be thankful for that. But if it's, if it's a requirement to respond uh, in our activity, then it's not grace. Clement of Alexandria started, nah, get a question about obey here. Rightly then, to those who have believed and obey, grace will abound beyond measure. What do you mean by obey? So, see, the problem is that obedience a lot of times in context of the old languages means you hear and respond appropriately. So if I tell you, believe me, and then you believe me, what did you just do? You, you obeyed. So, but we get an idea of obedience, meaning you follow the law, and not necessarily in all the contexts. Um, Tertullian, 198, grace with the Lord once uh, learned and undertaken by us should never afterward be canceled by repetition of sin. Now, that's a huge statement because there's a lot of people within the, uh, the, the Catholic doctrines, uh, specifically around this time, that were arguing this point, that if you... Keep on doing the right sins. You're, you're canceling grace. And he took exception to that. Then there's this guy. If there was uh, the one of the earliest heretics in, in, in Christianity, this he'd be on my list. How do you pronounce his game again? Cyprian? Cyprian? Eh, whatever. 250 AD. How could a man say he believes in Christ if he does not do what Christ commanded him to do? From where will he attain the reward of faith if he will not keep the faith of the commandments? And again, um, he starts talking out of both sides with his mouth here. Is it free or is it not free? Is it by faith or is it not faith? What are you talking about? If it's command, then you do it by works. And there's strict, words, uh, strict verses about that. Same individual. He will make no advancement in his walk toward salvation, for he does not keep the truth of the way of salvation. He saw salvation as a process, one that had to be maintained and kept and earned. Novation. And according to the faith of the scripture, which says, but if the wicked will turn from all of his sins, which he hath committed, and will do righteousness, he shall live an eternal life. You can see how quickly, it doesn't take long, it went from grace to, it's God's grace. We can't do anything for it all the way to you. You have to commit your life fully to this and do righteousness. And then you'll have eternal life and shall not die in wickedness for the sins which he has committed shall be abolished from memory by the good deeds which, which succeeded. Wow. Your good deeds will succeed, will overcome the previous sins. What about the sins you're committing now? Like blasphemy. Now, as I was doing my um, research and I was, uh, you know, kind of I was, uh, getting information from individuals, I didn't want to do a whole lot of repetition. 
if you need to go back to understanding the some of the issues of the Catholic Church from about 300 to 1500, I do suggest that you um, go back and listen to Luther's class on that. I think I learned more in his lesson than I did all my research, but I went ahead and made some, some, things, some things around. But one of the things I didn't, I didn't notice, I wanted to point this out, that most of the councils, the Catholic Church councils from about 300 through 1500, had nothing to do with theology. Now, they did talk about Christology, as in who is Christ. That was a constant battle they were dealing with. But that was usually point number two out of 30. Everything else was about politics. Who are we kicking out today? Who is anathema today? Who is being turned around today? So therefore, when we when we deal with the, 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 the all the different councils, um, Council of Noble, anything you want to go with that, and the various different councils that they had, they're not really discussing a whole lot of matters of salvation and grace. And most of the time, they use the word grace because I would do searches on all their councils. Just look for the word grace. It had nothing to do with theology. It was always, you know, the Holy Spirit by His grace grants this council to be authoritative and whatever we come up with that's law like okay wow that's bold that's what how i moved that however and and i would even say that there's a lot of people within the catholic historians would agree with this the church there during the during the, the between 1000 to 1500 especially going all the way back to 300 um really became corrupt and through their corruption, the Catholic priests begin to read the Bible, and they begin to see something different. And that's where it really became problematic, because they started doing things which were completely not just not biblical, but unbiblical. They were going against Scripture, and therefore, when you, people started reading Scripture for themselves, they were finding something different. Now, before we get into the Reformation, I actually want to go ahead and say... Um, exactly what did the response of the catholic church have to the reformation and how is that understood today as regards to the the response to the reformation and so the main council that dealt with the reformation directly was called the council of trent in december 13th 1545 so obviously well after martin luther they've had some battles and they decided we catholics need to get together and have a council and again, I have all the notes on this, but they are so wordy, and it's difficult to kind of parse out. So instead of me trying to go ahead and translate it for you, what I did was I have it in case you want it, or you can look it up for yourself. Just look up Council of Trent, look up all the different treaties, and read it. And you're going to go, okay, <sighs> sit back, and you have to do word by word, try to figure out what they're trying to say. Or... I let a Catholic explain the Council of Trent. Okay? So that's what I did. In today's language, an individual who, who understands is a historian on Catholics. Um, I believe it's uh, uh, advent.org or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, if you want that information, I'll give this to you as well. Here's what he says about the Council of Trent. Every adult soul sustained either with original sin or without or with actual mortal sin, children, of course, are exempted, where they get this from, I don't know. I've seen my children, you know, when they were six months old, they're little sinners. That's mortal sin. You're stealing tissues. So every adult soul stained either with original sin or with actual mortal sin, not children, of course, in order to arrive at the state of justification, which may be uh, passed through, okay, in order to, to arrive at a state of justification, pass through a short or long process of justification. Short or long, which may be likened to gradual development of the child in the mother's womb. I don't know how you have a short process of that, but okay. This development attains its fullness in the birth of the child, accompanied by the anguish and sufferings with which this birth is in, in, invariably attended. Our rebirth in God is likewise preceded by great spiritual sufferings of fear and contrition. Your justification, according to the basically the, the tenets of the Council of Trent, 
And all the things they were saying in regards to justification means it's going to be a long, hard process. There is no, hey, I believe that. Now I'm saved. I get to go to heaven. It takes a process. In the process of justification, we must distinguish two periods. First, the preparatory acts, okay, or dispositions. Now, they would have that as faith, fear, hope, and etc. Then, the last decisive moment of the transformation of the sinner from the state of sin to that of justification or sanctifying grace. That's a long road to get to grace. A long road. which may be called the act of justification with this, the real process come to an end and the state of habitual holiness and sonship of God begins. So they have this idea that salvation, justification, going to heaven, being right with God is this long, tedious, hard process. And they say these words within the context of not only their, their, their catechisms, their councils, but even if you just speak to a few apologists. The, the funny thing is, though, that the Catholic Church as a whole would actually say they agree with sol sola gratia. It's by grace and grace alone. And they would actually define grace appropriately at times, but it is not in their definitions of terms that there's a problem but it's actually um, within their, I say within their definitions that problems ensue. Their definitions, I would say, as far as how they apply their definitions would ensue. Like, for example, here's a catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, I think I have the article here. It is the second edition, Article 2, 1 through 4. They affirm sola gratia. Catechism of the Catholic Church defines grace as favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of divine nature, and of eternal life. If you put that on most evangelical churches, would we disagree? No, probably not. Now, some of the language going, it's kind of strange how you're talking about the, that. But at the same time, we'd be like, yes, the free and undeserved help, favor, benefit that God gives According to the catechisms, they affirm sola gratia and word and deny it by their doctrines. Here it is. Here is Marcus Grody. Marcus Grody is a Catholic theologian. Don't want, don't want to give him too much of a, too much credit here. Um, here's what he says about. Now again, this is partly faith because faith and grace. Whenever you're going to have faith alone and grace alone, in fact, for a long time they were not even separate uh, solas. They were just one sola. Faith alone will not save a person. Now, this is on the official Catholic website, EWTN, and, and they have his own special Catholic ordained, Roman Catholic Church ordained TV show. And here's how he talks about this. Faith alone will not save a person. To attain salvation, a person must, in response to God's grace, fulfill the following. I hope you have a pen ready. Believe in God. Put his faith in Jesus, repent of his sins, be baptized, remain in the fold of the church, hope in God, persevere in charity, and finally die in a state of grace. Holy cow. To which I tell Marcus Grody, good luck. That, that's, a, that's a tall order. For Mother Teresa. Sola gratia, only grace, is a slogan that is used to differentiate a belief in grace alone, apart from works, in opposition to that doctrine. Okay? So how they responded to it, they got more. They, they basically said, okay, you're going to say grace alone, we're going to say grace alone, but that grace is going to cost you a lot. But didn't you say that grace was free and undeserved? Yes. But that grace, that free and undeserved, allows us, and this is where a lot of the times you'll see individuals who call themselves part of the Reformation will actually borrow uh, Catholic language. That grace allows us to begin the process. It doesn't end up there. Grace does not lead us to justification. 
grace begins our journey towards justification. So now let's go ahead and talk about the Reformation and Sola Gratia. So here we have the Reformers looking at what the Catholic Church was saying in regards to justification. Excellent point, I think, by all the speakers thus far. The solas were centered around one thing. How do I go to heaven? They didn't expand it out. And they kind of kept it right there. And to which, I'll be honest with you, that was the fight. Now, they talked a lot about that the church should not be selling indulgences and that the church should not be doing this and, and, and various different corruptions. But they were really kind of hinging on the fact is, how do I get that person to not go to hell? And how do I get him to enjoy eternity with God forever? And so they were, these solas were primarily built around that thought. It was a great battle to have, to which uh, we are very thankful for their efforts. I'll be honest with you. If I was there and I faced that beast, would I, be, would I stand up? I would hope so. But well, I've never been put in that situation. Uh, that's rough. So in order to be able to understand this, what I have basically taken a look at from the perspective of um, Sola Gratia is that looking at Martin Luther, Calvin, Council of Dort, the Heidelberg Catechism, famous works of the Reformation over the years to see how it was developed. Now, again, Martin Luther's primary emphasis as 95 Theses was mostly repudiation upon the church for being corrupt taking authority away from the scriptures, selling forgiveness through penance and indulgences. The five solas, although you can make an argument for some portions in there, did not originate from this petition. Um, what, one of my favorite persons that I came to appreciate uh, was Zwingli. I can never pronounce his name right now. I always forget it when I'm in conversation. Uh, 1523 um, put up 67 articles. He couldn't come up with 95. He tried but he came up with 67 articles. And these articles were basically a response or basically a compilation of a debate that he had with a Catholic church bishop, specifically dealing with the superiority over scripture. You're taking superiority over scripture. Um, and that was the main thrust of the refutation. However, he discussed salvation a little bit more boldly in his 67 articles than Martin Luther did in his 95 Theses. Here's a kind of synopsis, and again, I, I summarized them. He didn't say this directly all the time, but he definitely had this within his thought. Uh, first of all, Scripture is the authority, not the Catholic Church. Um, of course, you know you can just see the, the the head across the way going, you know, just bursting. The gospel does not need the Catholic Church. Ouch. Christ alone. Forgiveness is not for the church to grant or deny. And, and see, Luther said, you can't sell it. You should give it to them freely. He said, you don't have the right to deny, to, to forgive or deny sins. And come straight out and says, purgatory is denied. There's no such thing as purgatory. You're made that up. That's bold. How did he get there? How did he make these arguments? You know what he did? During the actual um, uh, debate, he had the Septuagint, the Hebrew scriptures, and the Greek scriptures and said, let's, let's talk about it. Because he understood these languages and he was able to go through and read these texts themselves and talk about that within the confines of his own people and their own language and have a discussion about the actual text and everyone's saying the bishop cannot answer him the bishop cannot answer him here's another statement um, made uh, this is not Zwingli this is the Heidenberg confession I, I thought I, did, did Zwingli write this I can't remember hmm? I don't think so uh, so this is not Zwingli here, but this is the uh, Heidenberg Confession, uh, 1563. So I had the wrong header on this. Uh, they, they put this up in Lord's Days. 
So like they had like 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 a solid year every, every Sunday. You would ask questions and answers, and they would teach from that. And so here's the one of the answers to the questions. I believe that God, because of Christ's sanctification, will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, by by grace, God's grants me righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. Wow. And again, not not Zwingli here. This is the Heidelberg Catechism. Great statement. Fantastic statement. Again. 1563, this is, this is, these are people who started reading the scriptures and started coming up with theological thought that was consistent with the scriptures. The canons of Dort, don't read the whole thing, very boring, number one. Number two, some of it's just off. But 1619, um, recorded in Article 5, faith in Jesus Christ, however, and salvation through him is a free gift of God. As scripture says, and they quote Ephesians 2.8. So they went to the text. What does it say about salvation? Here's Ephesians 2.8. What are you going to do with it? So the Reformation looked, started, and, and, and I find the actual history fascinating, although I really am glad there's other people that do it for us. Write it down, teach it. Because I find it exhausting. There's so much information out there trying to figure out exactly what people wrote and some things got distorted. Um, but I really started thinking about this and, and looking at it and realizing that their first their first goal dealing with the Reformation and arriving at sola gratia did not start with let's talk about grace. They didn't ask the question, what was their first goal? Well, if you go back to the sources of the Reformation, and obviously I think it goes beyond this, but John Wycliffe, right? Tyndale, what were they doing first? They were trying to release the scriptures from the grip of the church and bring it out so people can read it for themselves. You, so that you don't have to go to a priest and say, what does the Bible tell me about this? And just have to take their word for it. If the scripture is authoritative, let it stand on its own. I don't need you. I should have the scripture for myself. So after the reformers were convinced in the superiority over scripture, the superior, superiority of scripture over the Catholic church, they began reading the text for themselves. And then they go, wait a second. Where are they getting this doctrine? And so then I decided, you know what? If we're going to go ahead and, and want the reformers to see how they looked at it, instead of trying to read their letters and their arguments, did anyone write anything about verses? And the, the, the most you can really get that's kind of clear on this is, is Martin Luther and John Calvin and a few other places dealing specifically with the book of Galatians. So Galatians 2.16 in our NASB reads as such. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So if you're reading the Bible kind of anew and afresh, and you read that verse, and you go, uh, I've been told I have to do a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, you know the last of the letters, you know the thing. Sorry. Here's what Martin Luther says about it. A person simply is not justified by the works of the law. Where did he get that from? Did he have to parse? Did he have to go, hmm, I wonder what that really means. He basically just quoted it. The works of the law, according to Paul, include the whole law, judicial, ceremonial, moral. I don't know where they get the break up from, but okay. Now, the performance of the moral law cannot justify. How can the ceremonial or the circumcision justify that's part of the ceremonial? So if he's recognizing that the law, and he goes other places where the law is contained, it's all of it. If you break it in one spot, you break it in all, right? So 
How can you say that circumcision doesn't save you, but following the rest of the law does? That doesn't make any sense. He reads it, and he makes an observation. What do we tell you is the first key to Bible study? Reading it, and then making observations. <laughs> okay? Galatians 2.21, one of my favorite verses out of 400. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came to the law, then Christ died needlessly. What did Martin Luther uh, observe here? We despise the grace of God when we observe the law for the purpose of being justified. The law is good, holy, profitable, but it does not justify. Where did he get that from? Did he all of a sudden have new thought and go, Bing. oh, wait a second, I have a new idea. No. He read something that was 1,500 years old and should have been something that had been repeated over and over again by those who said, we are believers in this Bible and in Jesus Christ. To keep the law in order to be justified means to reject grace and deny Christ. To despise his sacrifice and to be lost. Now, please don't, don't take this as my, like, bing on Martin Luther. As we've said, uh, he would read one thing and get it right, and then he'd read it to something else and go, did you observe the same thing I observed? How did you come up with infant baptism? Where's that written? He relied upon tradition. It took him a while to figure out a few things. Um, but I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, after kind of reading him more and more, I do believe him to be saved. I, I'll, I believe I'll see him in heaven. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know if I'd have done any better. It's hard for us to get rid of the garbage we have in our brains. But when we start like purging it through, however, if he remained true to the word, normative, literal, grammatical, historical, given enough time, I believe he ends up at the same spot. John Calvin on the same ideas. John Calvin is an enigma to me. I'm going, sometimes I'm going, he completely violates his own rules. Why? Because they're not consistent with the with the literal grammatical historical. Um, at the same time, I think they did great work. Paul demonstrates that whatever grace they had received from God, they were not at liberty to trust in man or in themselves as if they deserved this from God. No. Rather, they had to seek his refuge and free bounty, recognize that salvation is in Christ alone, who came to rescue from perdition those who were already lost. Um, there's several questions about original sin and dealing with that kind of idea. I, I'm, that's not where I'm going with this. I'm simply just looking at the verses dealing with grace and how they kind of observe that in regards to salvation was free. Free gift. John Calvin continues. In short, it would be easier to mix fire and water than, than say this, that we can merit a measure of the grace of God and yet also need the aid of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's a fascinating statement because many people who follow John Calvin believe that you have a means of grace. Like, now, I don't, know, I, I don't know where he started, where he ended, where he was in the middle, so I don't know exactly where John Calvin is on the train as far as his overall conclusions are, but this right here says... There's nothing you can do to merit a grace. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's not grace. If we analyze, uh, I just borrowed the, the old translations, by the way. So analysts, if we analyze salvation in its most basic sense, we will say that our, we are saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philip Malachma, again, I can't read it. What's that? Melanchthon, if you say so, Favre. In his, in his work, Apology, uh, now Apology does not mean, I'm sorry, Apology meant defense. Okay, so he's given a defense, and he's writing this one in one of the confessions. Um let pious conscience know, therefore, that God commands them to believe that they are freely give, forgiven because of Christ, not because of our works. Let them sustain themselves with this command of God against despair and against the terrors 
of sin and death. So what do we have? We have great men, and I say great men because they're what they had to stand up against and the pressures they had politically, socially, religiously, and even against their own life as a threat to be able to stand up and say, no, the church is not where we go to get information. It should be, but you're not upholding scripture. Scripture is that authority. You don't have any authority on yourself. Once you become a priest, doesn't mean that you're better than I am. Just because you're a priest doesn't mean that you, you're speaking for God. This book speaks for God, and therefore we should use that book to be able to understand what the truth is. So as we have learned, Friday night, today, we have a sine qua non. Uh, the sine qua non, as understood, there are uh, there are necessities for understanding. Um, we're discussing biblical interpretation. What is the sine qua non? To read it in its normal, plain sense. We look at grammar. We look at the historical nature and the culture of the people. We look at the authorial intent. What did the author want to say? Sometimes we look at the the situation of the um, of the audience and say, what did they? What were they going through? What problems did they have? Can we understand that so that we can put ourselves in that situation so that we can see the voice of God being spoken through apostles and prophets so that we can under have a greater understanding of God's plan, drawing out the principles and leaving what direct what does not directly affect us behind. Uh, we do that a lot when it comes down to obvious things. Right. We read the Bible and even if we take it historic and, and, and authoritatively, but if we want to say we try to apply everything to our lives, we don't go read Genesis six and go go build a boat. And they go, OK. No, it's not for me. So we, we we definitely have to make sure that we don't take direct communication to an individual as saying, what should I do? But what we do take is God speaking to Noah, go build a boat and go, who is God? What's his character like? Who is he? How do we understand him better? So we take a literal, normative, grammatical, we, we approach grammar, vocabulary, understanding that words are used within sentences and sentences have syntax and we have to find the adverbs and the adjectives, the articles. I love the article, right, Chris? Love the article. That was probably my first um, formal grammatical lesson. You're going to love the ha. <laughs> That's the Greek, the. And I do love it. And then take the historical and cultural nature of that text in its context and say, what does this mean? And what did the author intend to communicate? Then we take out the principles and understand it appropriately. So, as we have already seen, Scripture gives us all that we need to understand the plan of God to justify and save men from the penalty of sin and death. Now, here's the beauty of it. And here's, and I've, uh, and don't take my word for it because I've done the study. Just, actually, I think you'll know where I'm going with this. There are easy texts and there are some difficult texts, right? Are there some times you're going, Man, this is, a, number one, a hard translation. Number two, it's in a different context. Number three, I don't know what they're talking about. But there's some times in the Bible that you read it and go, that's easy. That's plain language. There's, there's no beating around the bush. He's speaking very direct. The epistles do this a lot, right? Sometimes you get in the narrative. Sometimes you get into Ezekiel. You get into some of the Revelation. You get into Jeremiah, and you read it and go, uh, why are you laying on your side again? I don't get it. But then you get to the epistles and 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 the and the uh, and the uh, prophets and uh, the uh, apostles are answering direct questions and direct problems. And it gives us insight into specific questions that we often ask. And so, therefore, we can read and we don't even have to know much Greek. We just have to simply read it in the context in which it was given. So to do that, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 3. Let's look at grace a little bit and see what the Reformers saw 
using the simple, normative, literal, grammatical, historical nature. Paul is addressing the Roman church. He is trying to get there, but he is under captivity, and he doesn't know if he's going to get there. So because his plan was to go, and he doesn't know if he will go, he's writing a letter just in case he doesn't get there so that he can give them everything he was going to give them as if he was there in person. And one of the things was an understanding of God's grace. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it begins with this. Because, now again, there's a lot of context here. Feel free to read it. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For though the law came through the law, came the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for, the, for all those who believe. There, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, we don't have to know Greek. We can go ahead and say, I'm going to go ahead and trust this, this translation as a proper translation. And you're going to say, okay, I'm going to be justified. What does justified mean? Is that basically I'm going to have a, uh, a, a criminal expungement upon my record didn't mean it didn't happen it means of being justified as a gift what's a gift mean what do you do for a gift now we can say that i got that car i stole that car i can say that car was a gift because i went to the dealer and they gave me a two thousand dollar car for one thousand dollars is that really a gift no then we can go ahead and look at the word grace now what does the word grace mean? Is it simply just is it simply just good things, or does it have an intention behind it? We'll table that for just a second. So we're justified as a gift. We can leave it right there and go. What? What does that mean? How do you understand that? Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, Romans three twenty eight. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Going on to further in Romans, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Again, read it in full context. I dare you. Oh, you dare? Yes, I dare you. You're not chicken, are you? Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor. Favor is the word grace. Same word, exact, same exact word. Bad, this is, this is what I say bad translation, right? His, his way does not create as grace, but what is what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So if you work and you deserve something, what does that mean? It's not grace. If it's grace, what can you not do for it? You can't work for it. For this reason, it is by faith in order that may be in accordance with grace. Wait a second. Faith and grace work together? Absolutely. Why? Now, here's where I'll differentiate with a few people, even in our own camps. Faith is not a non-meritorious work. Faith is always contrasted with work. Faith is not work. To believe something is not a work. Not as, as I am an effort. We can get into the whole nature of belief and concepts of that. But simply, faith and grace must work together. If it's by grace, then there's only two options. If it's something is by grace, there's only two options. Either A, it's applied to everybody, or B, it's going to be limited. But how do you limit something if it's by grace? By doing something, by giving it to people who do something that is non-meritorious belief. So in order for something to be by grace, it has to be by faith so that the promises will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, because Abraham was the model, Abraham the believer. Romans 6.23, we know the verse 2. It should be on everyone's bumper sticker, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, that's a charisma word, a cousin of charis, 
the verb, the charisma, uh, sorry, another, sorry, not a verb, another noun similar to charis, charisma of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. One of my favorite ones is taken way out of context, but I still use it. Romans 11, 6. Romans 11 is about Israel. Okay? That God held the remnant of Israel according to God's gracious choice. But if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now, I can go ahead and tell you in this context what it's about. But I can tell you the nature of grace in a principle they can't be based upon works. If Israel was to maintain its standing before God based upon works, what would you say would be the hit, would be the nature of Israel? The way of Edom. The way of Moab. The way of ancient Egypt. Because ancient Egypt isn't today's Egypt. Their being alive and their being a remnant, and them being still the chosen nation of God, is only by grace. It is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, you can't call it grace. If they deserve it, it's not grace. Therefore, anything we do, anything that we do, that we say, I deserve that grace, it is no longer grace. We automatically dispel it. Of course, we read Galatians 2.21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So if there was something I can do in order to obtain righteousness before God, if there was something I can do to merit my salvation, my forgiveness, then Christ would not have had to die. He would simply just tell me to do that. Here's how far Paul takes this. Now, when we, we're teaching Galatians after Jude, so I don't want to spoil too much fun, but Galatians chapter 5, verse 4 is fascinating verse about what this means in its context. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. We have to look at the whole idea of justification in the book of Galatians, fallen, and what does that mean? And the, and the concept here, what do they mean? You, you've left grace behind. You, you said it's by grace, you started that way, but then all of a sudden you went a different path. And now you're trying to live by flesh, by works, by effort. Because here's the beauty of it. You nailed it earlier, right? In Titus chapter 2. Beautiful. We are not only saved, justified by, by in front of God. We are not only righteous before God, based solely on his grace alone. We also live by it. That's our modus operandi. It's our operating system. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So if you're going to deny that salvation is a free gift of God, what do you have to do with all these verses? You have to sit there and explain what grace is then. You have to deny, you have to, you have to explain what it means to be not of works. If you're going to tell me that I have to do something, a step, a sprinkle, a dip, a give, a eat, if I have to do physically something to manifest energy to earn this gift then why do you call it a gift call it a really good deal why do you say it's by grace say it's very very inexpensive but you cannot call it grace or a gift and of course what is the pinnacle of the grace salvic passages. Ephesians. If you want to go ahead and deal with who you were by our own nature and what God did in response to that nature by his grace, it's Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, chapter one through uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, 
in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is, which is now in the works, working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's a bad position to be in. Bad off. You're born in a, in a horrible situation. What is God's response to our despair, to our need? Mercy is a compassion towards those who are in need. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show us, show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus for the glory of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Some hard statements. Grace is fundamental. Without understanding grace, you don't understand the nature of grace, then these verses make no sense. Grace is defined undisputedly and biblically, because I don't care how the English world dis defines it, right? Um, but grace is dispute undisputedly and biblically. So you got to deal with the biblical understanding of what grace is as undeserved benefit. Undeserved, unmerited, not worked for benefit. And then someone's going to come and tell you along, yes, that's true, but to get grace, you have to do means, you have to take, you have to do, you have to function. The biggest um, Catholic means of grace are acts of charity. As you do charity, you get grace. That's not grace. That's a quid pro quo. It's, you're doing something for something. You're getting paid. Even the Catholics agree to the definition. They just don't agree in the doctrines. They say grace is undeserved, but then when they go to apply the grace, they, they, they completely deny the nature of grace by the function. And the sad thing is, this happens not only in the Catholic world, this is a predominant issue within most denominations. Now, I say denominations because you go to their general websites and look at their own statements of faith. How do you obtain grace? Three things, typically, right? Three things. What's first? Repent. Turn from your sin. Now, that's not what the word repent means. It means change your mind. But they've taken repentance as be fully penitent. Probably the worst translation in the Latin Vulgate for metaneo. Change your mind. Be fully penitent. Don't know how that works. Fully penitent. Be really, really sorry. gut wrench sorry. You have to really hate your sin and not want to do it anymore. And live your and, and some people even say live your life in, in regards to repentance. Do you remember when we went over Catholic doctrines? That's numero uno. They've taken grace away, and we said, we're going to go ahead and continue on with the Catholic doctrines on repentance for, for grace. Number two, water baptism, typically. Okay? Typically, water baptism. Water baptism is a means of grace. I have to prepare myself. I have to go and get dipped in water or sprinkled or poured upon, whatever, whatever their definition of, of baptism is. Number three, Believe, typically. Now, believe, not a work. Well, have to, again, if you want to discuss the nature of believe and faith, it's, it's, not, it's not a work. It's not, it's not a non-meritorious work. It's not a work at all.
Once there is a means to grace, then the benefit is then earned, merited, and worked for, and the benefit is no longer grace. The issue then is that the grace of God is at the core of the redemption plan of God. So if grace is at the core, and you're saved by grace, and you erase grace, what did you do the formula? That's scary stuff. Because if you erase grace and saved by grace, then what are you saved by? Also, do you realize how it affects the glory of God? Because if you could say, God, you're providing a path for salvation, and as long as I am good enough to walk that path all the time of my life, and I get there, he's going to go, wow, you're so awesome. Come on in. What did I just do? It's I, I'm, I'm glorified. It's on me. I did it. The glory belongs here. And God does not get the glory. It affects the glory of God. So once again, if a person can earn God's blessing of life, then the glory is, not, is for the worker, not for God. And what does it say at the end of Ephesians 2, 2, 9? So that no one may boast. That's the reason why it's by grace. So that no one can take God's glory. But here's this third benefit. Okay, Remember we talked about this. The reformers had this all about salvation. It's all about redemption. It's, that's all it's all about. Now, there's nothing on the notes on this one. Uh, people looking for the answers. No. This is on my slides only. The beauty of this is we also live under grace. Romans 6, you're not under law. You're under grace. What do you mean under grace? Under grace means... That today we follow the will of God, not to obtain blessings, because under the law, under the law, Israel had to follow the law to obtain a blessing and to avoid curses. Right? If you follow the law, you're not cursed and you get blessings. If you don't follow the law, you don't get the blessing and you get cursed. Today we're under grace. Some of the stipulations within the law are kind of similar to the things that God wants us to do as a believer. Hey, don't kill anybody. Hey, don't steal from people. Love your neighbor. Don't commit acts of immorality. Stay away from idols. Sound familiar? A lot of it's the same thing because the principles of God and the nature of God are consistent. The difference is this. Under grace, guess what? You may not know it, but you have everything. And the beauty of it is, it's eternal. To Israel, it was temporal. Israel can do good things for 10 years, and they're blessed, and they're not cursed. And all of a sudden, year 11, they do something bad. They allow some idol worship in. They, they, they commit some acts of immorality. And what happens? Fire, brimstone, aliens come in, and whatever, just destruction. Not space aliens. Stop it. We are under grace. We have everything, and it's eternal benefit. Peter calls this, it's undefiled, unmerited benefit in heaven. There, it's there, waiting for you. And that's what we have to look forward to, a benefit for eternity, not for five years. So today... We follow the will of God not to obtain a blessing. We already have it. That's grace. And we, God took the curse for us. He hung upon a tree. So we don't have to avoid curses. We don't have to obtain blessings. We already are in that state. Instead, in Christ, we have everything under grace or by grace. He took the curse for us. Therefore, because we're in that situation, function in a way that is pleasing to him. Understand who you are, understand all the blessings you have being in Christ, and go and live your life in accordance. Use that as your motivating factor. Help that change your want. What do you want to do? We're saved by grace. We live by grace. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for your grace. It's truly a blessing. As we have learned and studied and, and taken your word for its truth. Allow us to not add one smidgen of work to your grace so that your glory will be all for yourself. Thank you for your word. Help us learn and grow to change our minds. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.